Good morning, small but extremely intelligent crowd. You're intelligent because you know that art is important, and I'm impressed with that. We always know that August is a tough time to get people away from their vacations wherever it is, um, but we do have vacation people here, so the bucket list tour of travel. Travel people are here, that's great. I want to thank our presenting sponsors, Portland General Electric and Riverview Community Bank. Larry, thank you for making the arrangements today and for sponsoring this. We also want to thank our education sponsor, which is Gresham Barlow School District, and our media sponsor, Metro East Community Media. Keith Thomas is here. And I need to let you know that there's flyers on, um, oh, they're not on your table, but they are as you head out. And this is how you can see what you saw today once again, or let your friends know. So Keith always provides this for us. Uh, that's when they're going to be televised. Would you, um, we would like to recognize any elected officials that, that are here today. And I am so pleased to see Shirley Craddock here. Shirley, thank you so much for being here. She's our met Metro Counselor, thank you. Are there any other elected officials? You're all, the rest of you are really smart. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, this, the microphone seems to be quite a ways away today. I'm not sure why. Uh, we want to also recognize our chamber board members that are here today, and the list is very long. <laughs> our next president is here with us, Sue Piazza. Sue Piazza, thank you so much. Bucket list travel tours. And um, the, the conversation that we're going to have today is timely in a lot of ways. We've had a lot of action going on in downtown Gresham, and we have an, a national company that's here in town. And you know that we do Music Monday, so it could not be better, um, better suited for, for today. I want to then introduce Brian Lessler, who's the chair of the Government Affairs Council. Now, why is Government Affairs involved with art? Why are you involved with art, Brian? I will tell you later. Brian is, the, Brian is the chair of the council, and he's going to introduce our guest this morning. Brian Lesser of PDG Construction. Brian? Thank you, Lynn. So art, stop and think about how you would define art for a minute. So you're now engaged in an age-old dialogue or debate that art historians and artists have struggled with for centuries. Here's one of the more broad, broadly described uh, definitions that I ran across. The expression or application of human creative skill and imagination. So art, why discuss it and what's in it for me? or for you? Great question, and today we present four different perspectives <clears throat> and answers. We have four panel members today representing local, regional, and national art artists and art forms. They will introduce their own organizations and will talk about potential economic opportunities, the unveiling of their vision, and they will answer all of your questions. <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce each of them individually. Uh, and first to speak, um, who really doesn't need an introduction, is Sue O'Halloran, representing the Center for the Arts. Sue, I'm told that you have five minutes. Okay, we'll see. I wrote it out so I wouldn't forget. Okay. Well, just a brief history. Um, I'm here for the Center for the Arts Foundation, and it began a little over 10 years ago in August of 2005. And we were really pleased because by October we had received our 501c3, which meant that we could go to work really right away as a charitable nonprofit. And but I wanted tell you how we uh, started with a vision and a mission and we've made maybe a little couple of twitches to it but we have felt like it has carried us through and really helped us to be focused what we're doing 
So our vision is a community enriched by vibrant and diverse arts experiences for Gresham and the surrounding areas. The mission of the foundation is to promote, facilitate, and advocate for the arts in the Gresham and surrounding areas. And we do this by cultivating financial and other resources to support the arts. So as I kind of give you a little overview today, you'll see that we have stayed pretty close to that particular theme. It all began following a campaign to raise dollars for an events art building to be built on two acres that were donated to the city of Gresham right in the heart of downtown. And the Oregon Community Foundation was a partner in the beginning until we had established the 501c3. So that campaign then worked with Oregon Community Foundation, which is such a treasure really for our state. And um, we were happy to have their assistance. Ultimately though, city leadership uh, wasn't convinced that public dollars were warranted for such a building. So the campaign dollars went into the design and construction of what we know today as Gresham's Arts Plaza. And actually, Carol Nielsen, Carol Nielsen when as a counselor, was really instrumental in making that happen. So I really want to acknowledge that. The foundation then went forward with seeking private contributions to the plaza sculptures and they're known as fine-tuned tool, representing the four arts, music, literature, dance, and visual arts. And they were inspired by four instruments, and we get asked this a lot, and some people intuitively get it, but those four instruments were the paintbrush, the trumpet, the fountain pen, and the tutu. And then three years ago, the city initiated the two fountains that offer drama in both pattern and color to the plaza, becoming really a centerpiece. In the past 10 years or so, we've collaborated with other arts organizations in presenting art exhibits, safari through the orchestra with Columbia Symphony, musical theater with Stumptown Stages, a third Thursday studio lecture series at the Gresham Historical Society Museum, a theater one-woman show featuring Eleanor Roosevelt's story. We had a dance party, um, and that was a tribute to Neil Diamond on the plaza. And we have had jazz music both on the plaza and around downtown uh, through the years collaborating with Gresham Mount Hood Jazz Association. And most importantly, we've had eight years, this is our eighth year, of doing the Music Monday concerts all through July and August on the plaza, which we're very proud. Our latest endeavor is the Downtown Gresham Memory Wall along Northeast Third, and that is between uh, Maine and Roberts, and it links Maine with the Arts Plaza so this walk along History Lane to the Arts Plaza and the Fountains, plus the new sculptures along Main, uh, that a, this then becomes a major draw to bring visitors to historic downtown Gresham. Shopping and dining supporting local economy. In our quarterly gathering of the arts, we are reaching out and gathering together organizations and individuals to help us know one another, understand the depth of commitment to the arts that exist, and how best to support arts community. In reaching websites, to kind of give you a little bit of economic perspective, um, here's some facts. Top reasons Americans attend the arts 73% socializing with friends and family, 64% because they want to learn new things, 51 support um, community. And strongest attendees I thought was interesting is actually the middle class. So just a couple of other little facts, 2015 contributions to Oregon Cultural Trust were 4.56 million, and 60% of that comes back to us throughout the state. And one last little quote I want to give you is from the National Endowment of the Arts. 
This country is what it is today because of its commitment to chasing wild dreams, pursuing innovative ideas, and finding the passion that ignites the spirit. Its creative creativity connects is designed to show how the arts contribute to the nation's ecosystem. And we at the Center for the Arts Foundation endeavor to add our small part in adding to that <coughs> ecosystem and making our community vibrant and economically strong. I did skip some of the text, so I could be on top. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, <clears throat> next, I'd like you to welcome Betsy Hatton from the Portland Columbia Symphony Orchestra. Betsy. Okay, I'll try to keep this five minutes, but if you know me, you know that's difficult. Um, Portland Columbia Symphony has been around for 35 years. Of those 35 years, I joined the orchestra when the earth was still cooling, and I've been executive director for the past 16 years, but I'm a violinist first and foremost. Um, 12 years ago, we decided we wanted to expand what we do. We're a public benefit corporation. We bring arts to people, and we looked for a community that's which in which to do this that supported the arts. We came, we saw, we stayed. We started with about 50 people at our first concert, and now we're about 300 every time we we have a concert, so we've, we've grown. Um, speaking to business people, I never expected to be in a business that never, ever, ever has paid for itself, where 1% of the population partake of it. Everybody thinks the performing arts should be free, but every school child should be thoroughly schooled in it, and that we have to beg for money full time just to continue to exist. Um, and then when I say I'm the executive director of a symphony, everybody goes, wow, that's cool. You know, that must be so exciting. And it is, but it's hard work. Um, and I say symphony orchestra, I don't say classical music. And that's one of the things I want to dispel about our industry is that we're somehow scary, that we're stuffy, that we wear tuxedos and long black. Well, that why? Because we used to serve you your soup at your house and then pick up the flute and play. We look like waiters because we were waiters in the fancy homes of Europe. You would have been dressed way nicer than we were. And now that has just remained a tradition that we call ourselves servants, servants of the music. So we maintain that tradition and most people, interestingly, like it. They don't want to see an orchestra dressed down. They want to go to that particular concert and feel that it's special. So. Why is it special? Why, is it, why do people think it's scary? Well, they hear the term classical music and they don't know how to relate to it. It's symphonic music. You all remember Mighty Mouse or um, uh, Ace Ventura or Airplane 2. All of those have classical music playing in it, symphonic music. All of the John Williams scores to Raider of, Raiders of the Lost Ark, all of these things are full symphony orchestra. But you're hearing it in a context that you can relate to. Um, and that's why I would love to invite every single person here, come to a concert. I'm going to leave a stack of business cards out in the lobby. If you show up with that business card at any of our concerts, that will be your ticket to be able to come in. Or you can call me and I will set aside a ticket in your name. And I will make sure that one of our players, one of our board members or staff covers the cost of that ticket. The arts aren't free, they do cost. And even though we're a small orchestra, our budget is still about 400,000, 450,000. Oregon Symphony is, is 15 million. So that kind of shows where we are. We're a very small organization. But the economics of it is that when the last economic prosperity study was done and they started gathering the information in 2010 and it was released in 13, the arts, America's arts industry generate $135.1 billion of revenue. And just putting it in perspective, 98.5 of the expenditures that we have in my organization stay locally. We have very few things that go out of the state. Uh, we have performance fees that we have to pay, ASCAP BMI, and we rent music. 
and those that are a small fraction. Everything else stays locally. One of the biggest expenditures of the patrons for any performing arts is made when they go post buying the ticket. They, they stop by and, and eat a meal at a restaurant. They fill up their car with gas. They hire a local babysitter. All of that money on top of the ticket price is another, say, I think it was $24.61 on average. But, so I've got one minute. So economic impact is huge. There are some conclusions. Arts are an industry. They, they make responsible businesses, employers, and consumers. Arts are good for local, the local marketplace. As I said, every time a person comes to an art uh, exhibit or a concert, they spend extra money in the community. They're the, a cornerstone of tourism. There's a societal impact that goes beyond the economics of it. Um, as Sue alluded to, the arts are a universal language where we can express ourselves, where we don't need words. And they make sense, they transcend you know, culture, age, ethnicities. Building a 21st century workforce. Most reports show that creativity is extremely high on an employer's list of traits they want in their new employees. The arts create that. Uh, especially music, you use both halves of your brain. You use the creative side for the expression, you use the mathematical side to generate the music. After all, rhythm is sound divided by time, and you have to have that, that metric meter going off in your head full time to make music. And finally, Arts create a stronger community. There's been study after study after study that show that a vibrant arts community is, in, encourages higher civic uh, engagement, there's a, more of a social cohesion, higher child welfare, and lower poverty rates in areas that have vibrant arts communities. And there was one uh, attorney general who was, to paraphrase a quote, that children who pick up an instrument or a paintbrush almost never pick up a gun. So beyond the economics of, of the arts, there's the societal benefit that I think needs to be, needs to be recognized. And I think we need to have a, a corporate, collective, governmental, and citizen-based um, will, collective will, to sustain the arts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. I'm going to have to check in and see which half of my brain wasn't working when my grandmother was trying to force <laughs> me to take piano lessons. <clears throat> Next, uh, I'd like to have a warm welcome for Judy Hahn, who is going to be uh, speaking to you from the Gresham Outdoor Public Arts Group. Thank you. OK, five minutes. Let's see how fast I can do this. Um, Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, letting me come up and speak about Gresham Outdoor Public Art. So here's the deal. 15 years ago, I started the Art Walk. Um, I was the president of the Boosters, and I saw, saw us getting lost in the big boxes, and I saw the malls coming in. I went, oh my gosh, we're going to lose our living room. We're going to lose the center of our community. So I thought, OK, uh, light, why don't we do some art? Let's have, let's have enough art. So in 15 years, I had 25 artisans there. Maybe 1,500 people showed up. It was three blocks long. I tried to stretch it. We had some theater. Um, Kevin Minkoff came and did a show dance. I mean, we were just grabbing everybody. I grabbed a guy that had played the cello, and he's got a piece of carpet from Bob at Amaton. We set it out. We started playing music. In 15 years, we've gone from 1,500 to 15,000 people that came to this last event. It was the largest event there was. I did it for 13 years, and then I went to Mayor Bemis and I said, okay, I am uh, 65 Medicare. I can't lift another shoe, Paul. So, and it needs to grow, and it can't, it needs to move on, and sometimes you need to step back and let other people step up and see something else, and they have done that, and it's doing great. Imagine the possibilities. I've always said that art is the vehicle that bridges it, the communities, the cultures, the cities, the people that live here, and businesses together. Art is the vehicle. Imagine the possibilities. Downtown is a direct reflection 
of how our community sees ourselves. It provides a sense of community and a place, and it is the living room of our city and the heart and soul of our city. Outside of Gresham, we hear a lot about the negative, the homeless, the shootings, uh, Rockwood, blah, 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 East County. We are more than that. We are more than that, and we need to show that we are more than that. That is how they see it. We need to change that image. I want to also give a shout out to John Clark. During the art walk, John Clark gave over $26,000 to make that event happen. It would have happened, but not to the extent it did. It allowed us to bring painted banners and hang banners up in the polls because we had no dollars, so what could we do? And I hung them up and I kept saying, now this is the start, imagine the possibilities. We're starting with a banner. So we kept the 501c3. I grabbed a few people, Gretchen Brown, Carol Nielsen, Kevin Kennard, Marty Stone, David Bauman, Sue Myers, Leslie Radke, uh, Rosemary Nugent, Charlotte Becker, and Rip Caswell. And I said, would you come with me and help me get this group going? And it's Gresham Outdoor Public Art, or GOPA, and our, and our mission is to bring permanent public art to the streets of Gresham. And I have a photo of one of them, the guide dog. So in less than one year, we have a guide dog done by an artist, Heather Soderberg of Cascade Locks. Just happened that she was working on a guide dog for, as a commission. She owned the forms and whatever. And I, we went to her, David Bauman and Carol, we talked to her and she says, well, come see what I'm doing. And she says, well, it happens to be a guide dog. And I remember turning to Carol and David and said, okay, that's the first piece. So that was the first piece of art is on the corner of Third and Main. There is a plaque being made. It should be ready in a couple of weeks. The plaque will be made as you read it, dedicated to all dogs, all service dogs, and it will also be done in Braille. There was an epiphany one day. We're talking guide dogs, Judy. That's about sight. We need Braille. So it will be done in Braille. Um, there's a whole story to that, but we don't have time. Gre Gresham Breakfast Lions Club, thank you. Gresham Breakfast Lions Club, the citizens of Gresham, Heather Soderberg, that's who made this happen. It's because of them. I went to Pat Swift, would you consider donating? They said yes, that's part of their legacy in this community. Okay, now we're on to the mural. The mural is on the Jazzy Bagel Building. It is a depiction of the Rexall Drugstore in the 1900s. I went to Dick Dowsett and said I'd like to be, have a mural. He said I have no money. I said I want permission. He gave me permission and we drew it out. We hired um, commissioned Don Gray, a historic muralist who has done historic murals across the U.S. And with the support of Dick Dowsett's family and also Sue Piazza and Michael Patrick who gave money to make this mural happen and others in the community, the mural is finished. If you get an opportunity, go by and look at it. People have been calling me and saying, I'm sitting in the car at the Glass Butterfly parking lot and I'm looking at the mural. It's like looking at, the, uh, at a TV, at a screen. It's just stunning. Look at it. It will bring back and evoke all the memories. That's what art does. Art brings us back. This is a difficult world we live in. Everything is very hard. And we're always reaching out for the nostalgia, the car shows, the, the history, the murals, the ice cream parlors where we went. The, we're looking for that. Fundraising has become a real unique thing these days. It's called a funky junk sale. And it'll be happening every dang year. Leslie Radke and I, we become pickers for the arts. In my wildest dreams, I never thought I'd be picking for the arts. So we're picking for the arts and we have a funky junk sale. We had it in May. We made $4,750. Sue at Chase Me Again has given us two, has given us an opportunity for two booths at Chase Me Again. We again go picking for the arts, we bring it in, people buy things. Over the last seven months we have generated $7,000. So that's the new fundraising technique. You don't get grants, you go funky junk sales. So when we can't get police bonds and everything to work, we can't get school bonds to pass, what do you do? How do you ask for money for the arts? and yet they're very key to our community. That dog has evoked kids, people, everybody patting. I mean, there was a city employee picking up the garbage and as she dumped it back, she ran back to her truck and she patted the dog on the nose like it was a dog, a real dog. <laughs> um, when we had the funky junk sale, people would come and buy and every time they left, there was a story. Carol said, Judy, you got the story. Whether you spend $5 or $500, you are now a part of that mural. You're a part of that project. 
So I say one more thing. Imagine the possibilities if people in this room went online to GoPa or Betsy's group or Carol's group and donated the price of your meal today or the cup of coffee you bought or whatever it is. Imagine the possibilities that can happen in our community with just that. So imagine the possibilities. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Judy. Um, just anecdotally, I will tell you that the art walk actually started my daughter's art career. So uh, she, she's ultimately uh, turned into a very successful digital artist, um, evolved from a fine artist. But she had her first opportunity to display her work when she was in high school uh, at the art walk. So oh, Gresham High School. Yeah, Gresham yes, High School, right. <clears throat> so, very nice. She got that from the mother's side of the family, incidentally. So last but not least, um, a special addition to our panel. Please welcome the performance director from Odessio by C Cavalia. Did I say that right? Cavalia. Cavalia. <laughs> Darren Charles. Darren. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> Uh, so just a little bit about the arts. Um, I was very blessed to be part of the arts since I was 16. Before that, I was um, an athlete. And I was jack of all, master of none, a footballer, a runner, um, swimmer, diver. And one day I said to my dad, I want to be a dancer. And he's like, what? <laughs> so luckily, my parents were very supportive. And they sent me to London. And I studied four years in the performing arts tap, singing, music, everything. So the arts is, uh, is very important to me, and I see it's very important to you guys here as well. Um, when I got into the arts, it was very hard because I wasn't a natural dancer, so I had to make myself into a dancer. And now I'm a choreographer, and a dancer, and a director, and I work for Odysseo. Odysseo has 50 artists, 65 horses, it's the largest touring uh, show in the world, and I'm blessed to be a part of that. Um, it's been seen by over one, uh, a million, a million, I would say. Um, sorry, I'm very nervous today for a reason. I normally do this all the time. It's weird. <laughs> um, sorry, I know. Um, and at the moment with Odysseo in Portland, going back to the arts, I've uh, had two artists from Portland that I've employed. And I'm in the process of hiring another two from Portland because it's a very talented city for the circus, for the dance, and for what they contribute to uh, throughout the whole of the industry. Um, Odysseo has nothing to do with Circus Soleil. Uh, the co-founder of Odysseo was Norman Latterell. Um, he was the co-founder of Cirque du Soleil, so he went his own way and he created this magical show. If you haven't seen it, you should go and see it. It's very breathtaking, it's very different. Uh, there's nothing like it and I've been performing for over 28 years uh, with the Spice Girls, Take That, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Cameron McIntosh. Um, I performed in front of the Queen, um, but this show, is something that you would never see uh, in your life. If you don't go to see it, you will never see something like it. Um, it's very, very uh, breathtaking. It's something that you would, it moves you. The music, uh, the arts and the music that we have in the show, it's all a combination of what you're talking about today. You know, orchestras and it's a combination of dancing, uh, aerial work, horsemanship, um, and that's a form as well, you know, you have to be very talented in the arts to be a rider and you communicate, you still have to perform on a horse. So it's all relative. The same as if you're an athlete, you still have to perform what you're doing and how you're going to challenge yourself to win and to train and to get better. And ballet is what footballers do or um, athletes will do, they will always ask tennis players, they always revert back to ballet, which is the oldest form of art, I would say, along with music. Uh, so it's all relative, it's very strong, 
Um, I've supported the arts and taught underprivileged kids uh, back in the UK. I had my own dance company. I know how hard it is to uh, fundraise money uh, to, to create these kind of things, but it can be done. And I believe in Portland, you're doing it very well. Um, it's a great city for the arts and just walking around and the vibe you get, it's a, it's a beautiful city. Okay, thank you very much. How much longer? Uh, we will extend until uh, August 28th. Oh, good. And Kim has brought some flyers as well for you to uh, have a, a look at. So you've got two weeks to come and see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I know you got the the three of you in particular. Welcome uh, to to, uh, to here today. Uh, but I know Sue and you all, all you the three of you have worked so hard on making sure that the east part of the region, particularly Gresham, has a robust arts program available to the community. So thank you very much. Uh, question: I'm Just curi curious, and I know that you don't have a lot of funding, and you're it's like you're you're going to, uh, to out to community events to sell stuff to be able to raise money. But have you considered, has there been any effort uh, to how you can engage more students in arts in general? I'm thinking particularly with the performing arts. Have there been much effort that you've been doing to work uh, with the schools, uh, Gresham, Reynolds, Centennial, and in particularly the Title I schools? Because we really know that arts, children of less means have, don't have much access to art. Um, I didn't get to touch on this, but education is one, and outreach are huge components of what we do. Um, we would love to get into the schools. They're a hard nut to crack because they are so busy and they're so focused on what they have to do that sometimes an offer of bringing um, a group of musicians or uh, some extra projects just you've got to find the right teacher, the right time, the right principal who's interested in it. But what we do do is um, we do have a, a, a group of teachers who will accept materials. We send out CDs of the music and lesson plans that relate to uh, generally our education con concerts, which right now we're focusing on Peter and the Wolf, but we've done Carnival of the Animals, which is um, narrated by uh, poems by Ogden Nash. So we have kids create poems, create artwork that relates to the music. So even if they can't go to the concert where we're going to play it, they can use that, the aural part of it, as a springboard for other creative arts. We do our symphonic safaris, which are um, happen to be at Park Rose because unfortunately we can never find a place in Gresham proper that is big enough for us to do it. Um, where, and it's generally at Halloween. Uh, where we, we play something of a focal point, and this year it will be Peter and the Wolf. We're using a young dance troupe to bring it to life. We've done puppets, we commissioned puppets for Peter and the Wolf with Tears of Joy. And then after we play some music and talk about it, we play another set of music and the students are able to safari through. It's our symphonic safari, is what we call it. Um, in addition, we have outreach tickets that go to 44 social service agencies and uh, about 50 schools for um, direct access to any of our concerts. And now you know, we're gonna be in the Multnomah County Public Library this year at their, um, oh, I think it's their Young Children's Readers uh, group that they have it of, on, on the weekends at a variety of the libraries. So we do a lot. And you know, we value that education because it keeps our art alive. But the hard part is, is that we're a performing arts group and not an education group. And so what we do has to relate to who we are and what our mission is. But part of our mission is accessibility and education. Shirley, I'm glad you brought that up. Last uh, fall, I went to Mount Hood Community College with Gretchen Brown and David Bauman. And we went out and talked to the sculpture department. And actually, I've been communicating with and, and have talked and actually have a sketch drawn out 
So the Mount Hood College students are, have something planned. We're working together on bringing something to the streets of Gresham. Uh, the school is out through the summer, we know that. So we made a plan on coming back and reconnecting again in the fall. Uh, they've drawn a whole thing out. They're very excited. When we first went out there, they said, why are you here? And I said, you know, you're the emerging new artist, just like Brian's daughter. The arts are, they stimulate, and we, we, we have the venue to place the art. There's the students with the art. They can do it. You put it together, we'll pay for the materials, and we'll, we'll provide the venue to put it. So they're very excited. And I think it's, again, that connection and that bridge between our community and our college and the arts and the student. Thank you for that question, Shirley, because it actually really is an important one, and one that um, has been, frankly, difficult to achieve. So as Betsy uh, mentioned, there's been the Right Brain Initiative through actually the Gresham Barlow schools, and we tried for two years to figure out how to bring some of the various artists that we are aware of, whether it's visual art or whether it's music or dance to be able to come in and help with some of that curriculum but it just really we never were able to actually get the district engaged in with with the time I think that's involved so actually after a couple of years we kind of just let that piece lie um, but a couple of things that we have done last year we worked with um, Sarah Dempsey over at Gresham High School and we did Rising Stars, which was a week of workshops in performance art, whether it was choreography, whether it was the music itself or the vocal. And so we did have a performance then on Music Mondays last year. This year, um, we tried to put that together again using um, the staff out at uh, at Barlow High School, because Sarah was taking the summer off. Couldn't quite get the pieces together, but we are still trying to put that together for next year. And again, it's collaboration, working with those people who know how to do it. So um, this year, what we did, though, in order to do something for Music Mondays with students, Corbett Children's <coughs> Theater has now moved its operation into downtown Gresham. And so Corbett's Children's Theater did come to Music Monday, the 1st of August, and do a performance of one of their musical theater performances. They're, they are awesome group. So we contributed to their organization in order to help support uh, what they do with scholarships for students at their organization. And lastly, um, we're working with the dean out at Mount Hood Community College in um, the arts department. We have an idea that a film festival would be an interesting thing to start up out here in the Gresham area and working with students from Mount Hood Community College. So that'll probably take us a year to kind of put that together, but we are looking at trying to do something with college um, age students and doing film festival, and maybe we can translate that back down into the high school level as well. So not that there isn't a real desire, but it's been, it's a little difficult because typically you've really got to access them through the school districts themselves. Another question? Darren, I have a whole bunch of questions while they're thinking of it. Could you go up? I've got, it's going to be a, um, one of those lightning round kind of things. Where are the horses? Where are yeah, they? Yeah, where are they housed? Where are they ah. right now? Are they downtown? <laughs> they're going up and down? The so, um, we have uh, each site that we go to, we prepare out outdoor paddocks um, and a walking area, and we create uh, our own stables as well. So if you've seen the tent, we have, a sh it's huge, and we house all the horses in there. And they also have an area where they can go out and, and be free during the day. So we have to find a big plot of land to enable us to build a village basically so the horses are kept in good condition and they still can go out 
and each, each time we move to a different city, we move to San Jose, the horses will go to a big ranch and they're not even rode for two weeks and they have vacation. <laughs> and then we start up again. <laughs> they get and paid on this paid yeah. vacation. Uh, and so th when they're treated like royalty. The horses when you are. Come, I have not seen your show. I know that Sue and Michael. My, did Michael get to go? I know that Sue got to go. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was just um, waiting for that. <laughs> uh, but I've I've done performing arts myself, and mm -hmm. we always brought our own sound crew, and we had our own musicians. Do you bring your own horse caregivers? Does, yes. do, do some of your folks dub for, you know, they do the oats in the daytime and they do the rides at the night? What we, they? Ha we have two teams um, and every city we go to, we hire local uh, people, okay. staff to uh, help with us, the grooms during the day. And then we have our own team uh, that looks after the show at night. So we're 140 permanent staff. Uh, around that number and they travel with the show all the time and it, we hire about 200 people from the city that we're in wow that's yeah. a big and, okay uh, so i know now where the horses are where are your people where do they stay they find us apartments so i'm living in the pearl district right now but the artists all generally stay in one big apartment complex oh what not a hotel you're just a big apartment yeah we try and give them a life in a hotel you're a bit restricted sometimes so if they have a kitchen and they have they share rooms uh, so we need to make them comfortable as well just as we do the horses happy life for everybody and then you get a good show <laughs> how long are you on the road um i've been with the show for five years so i started the creation so i came in uh, choreographed it and then as i said they hired me as the director uh, so five and a half years is how long i've been with the company so do you have a home? Do you go back to a home, or you go? I from do have a home. One location to another location. I have I have the luxury of going home to the UK between cities if I choose to. I've got my son with me at the minute, oh. uh, so he's he's going to stay with me. But we always send uh, people home if we can, uh, because we've got people from France, uh, Ukraine, Spain, um, uh, a lot a lot in Europe. So between the cities, we'll always try our best to send them home. When we're on the west coast, it's a little bit far. They, the break is only 10 days, so they can choose if they want to go home or they can um, go on vacation somewhere else. So they, they have their vacation as well. What is the most fun that you've had since you've been in Portland? And it doesn't have to be in Portland, but you've been in the Portland area, the Oregon area. What's the most fun attraction or whatever that you've done while you've been here? <laughs> What's the it second happens most late fun at night. Thing? <laughs> um, I haven't seen, I've only seen the city so far. I'm, I'm wanting to go to the coast. I drove along that. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like the beer here. Oh. <laughs> the bars are really nice. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but isn't it a little bit too cold for nope. you? Is it the brew? Isn't it UK brew, warm brew compared to chilled brew? No, it's it's good. I like okay. it. I don't travel a lot. Yeah, yeah. And I don't beer a lot either. You know, and the, I want to go to a winery. I, I haven't I haven't done a great deal because we only get one day off a week. So you try and. Pack it all in, or you rest because you're oh, tired. You rest? Yeah, oh, you, yeah, yeah, you're you tired. Rest. So, how many days? Uh, how many hours a day do you work? Right, is it a nine to five job, or is it a five no, to nine job? No, I or? start about two in the afternoon, and I'll finish after the show at night. Really? So, yeah. But generally, it's maybe a ten-hour day for okay. me. Okay. I'm not sure if this lightning round, where our lightning round is over, but I'm going to let Brian have okay. the mic. I grew up on Hayburner, so I'm kind of curious how the concept evolved of taking dance and acrobatics and horses and putting those together in a, um, a show. Um, I think because Norman had the, the initial relationship with Cirque first, um, and there's never really an equestrian show that was it's always been an equestrian show or a dance show or a circus show. So he wanted to bring those two together to see how it would work and it worked really well. So he took a chance on seeing how you could, yeah, it was experimental. Um, he has a, another show that's been going uh, for 10 years, that's called Cavalier, um, and that's in China at the moment and that toured uh, the States for 10 years. Um, and it's, it was in Portland maybe four years, five years ago. Did you see that when it came before? It's much smaller. 
it was m much smaller. Um, so he, he kind of had a, a, the experimental feeling of already, and then this show he just uh, went all out uh, and combined the two, and combined the arts, in fact, yeah, yeah. I wanna go back in history. You mentioned, you told us that you went from football, which I'm assuming is soccer. Yes. Um, <laughs> football and all the athletics, diving and swimming and all of that Olympic kind of stuff that we're seeing right now, into dance. What, what was the trigger? What made you say to yourself one morning, I think I wanna dance instead? Because you admitted that you didn't have, you, weren't, you had to make yourself a dancer. Yes. What happened? Um, good question. Um, I had a, a best friend, and every time that he, our, um, we wanted to go out, and he would say, oh, I'm going dancing, and I was like, well, I'm going to play football. And there was one night my football was cancelled, or he could have been swimming, and I went to meet him at his dance class, I, to meet him after, and I was looking through the window, and I was like, oh, that looks fun, I can do that. And I used to dance anyway, as I had a natural rhythm from my mother, my dad can't dance at all. Um, and he said, oh, why don't you try it? So I went in and the dance teacher said, oh, you, you're quite good. And then I just started going without telling my parents. And then I was going swimming and I wasn't going swimming. Or oh, football and I wasn't going to football. Can we edit that, please? <laughs> edit that out of the... And that lasted for about six months and I knew when I was turning 16, I had to decide on what I needed to do oh. for further education. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wasn't gonna be in the Olympics, it was my dream because I didn't do one particular thing, I was doing lots of different things. You have to direct yourself in just one discipline and then you can do it. And that's why I decided, okay, I don't know this, I'm gonna start from fresh and I'll be a dancer. So that's what happened. Back when I was in grade school, and some of you will experience, have experienced that too, we had to do dancing. We, did, we learned square dancing, I mean, we, you know, we had to do that. And we've talked about the arts here from the paintbrush and the sculpture and the, the music, but not the dance part. Do you think it's important to do, I do. dance as well? It's very expressive. There's some people, like I, I said, I was teaching underprivileged kids um, from about 12 to 16 at one point and they have a real raw talent because if the expression comes out if they're blocked somewhere or they can't feel that they can speak but they can speak through dance uh the motions come out in you know in contemporary or anything like that it becomes very expressive and i think it brings the best out in people as well and if you're not highly educated you can be highly educated in dance or in music or something physical. Um, so it is really important uh, for those people that can't express themselves that then they are able to express themselves through dance. Do you hire? I know you do the performing, but do you do the hiring as well? Yes. So I'm going to audition tomorrow. Sure. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Explain the audition process. Uh, so normally in Portland, um, I knew there was some circus schools. Um, on the website, sometimes we launch that we're looking for artists, but in Portland, I just put the word out to the schools. Um, and when they you will say schools, do you mean high schools, junior circus high? Circus schools. Okay. Yep. Okay, yep. sorry. That's okay. Circus schools. It's where they do the practice the silks, or they practice the hoop, or they do the trapeze, um, they do contortion. So it's all of those elements. Um, they will send their CV, a photo. Um, and I look at their experience. You've got to kind of hire people with experience, stage mm -hmm. experience, or they're absolutely amazing and they're just ready to go in the show. I will look at them. I will get them to, I will send them particular disciplines. I need you to be on silk, on hoop, and on rotating pole. So we have a pole, a big carousel comes down and it spins and the, the guys are climbing. They do a ballet basically on a Chinese pole, not a strip pole. <laughs> but it's like a strip pole, that's why, how they learn. Um, and I will do that process in the big top and then I will let them know if they've succeeded or not. And the two that I have right now, they're great. Will you take them with you or that's just gonna be here? Uh, no, they're gonna, they're gonna join the company and they're gonna travel oh. now. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. They're, they're actually a duet. So when oh. you see it, if you come and see it, they, they do a big hoop number in the middle. And they're a couple. Do you remember? Oh, 
Um, yeah. Sue remembers, that's good. Yeah, they're from Portland. And as I say, I'm just work workshopping another couple at the moment, um, which are great, and they're also from Portland. We would encourage you to come back. Just don't yeah. keep robbing all the talent. Yeah, right exactly. Here. Does somebody else have a question? Yes, Carlos. Do you pay them all the same, or do they get paid different for the discipline they learned? Uh, everyone's paid uh, generally with what they do in the show. Yeah. So the riders, it's across the board. There's no big influx in in uh, in their payment scheme, but. Um, it does depend on your experience and if you join the show for your first year over the three years your, your salary will increase anyway so do you pay them in u.s dollars or euros uh u.s and canadian depends where you're from yep i'm just a little curious the night that i went last week one particular horse kept nipping at this other horse in front of him and then he started nipping at the gal um, when there were four crossed yeah What's the craziest thing that's happened at a show with the horses not doing what they've been trained to do? Um, we have a few incidents. Um, I think one I can mention, it, right? Two weeks ago. <laughs> at the end of the show, um, they all run down the hill and they go to the front. One horse decided to go over the barrier. And he didn't want to, so his feet went over the barrier, then he, they slipped, so then it got underneath his belly. Then he panicked, pushed off his back legs, and then went into the auditorium. The rider that he tried to stand up, the horse slipped, uh, the rider fell down, they got up, and we had to exit the horse through the fire escape into the <laughs> VIP, and then into the stables. We were very lucky. The horse was fine, the rider was fine, but that's never happened before. It was just a, a freak accident. Um, a loss of balance uh, and a panic, but that's the craziest thing that's happened. Safety is a big uh, thing that we work on all the time, uh, especially if the horses are, are biting, then we, we need to separate them for a while, uh, but they have a mind of their own and we, we create a big playground for them and that's why the stage is so big and we really respect the horses and how they need to be. That's why the Liberty scene, that's them. That's, that's the horses performing. And they understand music too. They learn music. Yeah. Betsy, do any of your artists nip at each other too? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've known a few. Yes, from time to time we've had no we blood drawn. Yes. <laughs> Terry? Um, as far as an international um, artist that you've been doing, is there anything from the local community viewpoint that we could be doing different to make your job easier and attract you better? Um, I think, uh, going, going to dance, I think if you combine, um, do you have theatre schools here, professional, when you leave like a college? Yes. Is there something that uh, exists like that? Okay. Um, you have ballet schools and the musical theatre, or are they yes. separate? Portland State has a pretty good program. Yeah. Yeah. They're separate, right, the okay. ballet school from the music theater. Okay. Um, I think combining like circus and dance in one umbrella is a really good idea because you could train to be a ballet dancer, but you might be really talented at being a circus artist as well. Um, so it, and it's hard to find that um, combination of them under the umbrella. Like I have dancers in the show, but my dancers can't do the aerial work. And if they could, then I would be getting it, uh, you know, a, a real good deal of, of having that person. So you could dance and he can do the sing, the, the silks or the pole. So versatility is good. And I don't think there's enough versatility in the UK. I'm, I'm not so sure here, but if you could combine all of that together, dance is so popular, you know, with all, so you think you can dance on the TV. When I was auditioning, there was, 30 guys, now there's 300 guys auditioning for the same job. Um, so, going back to express, uh, expression, if you can create something where they can experiment in all of those fields that are related, then you'll get the best out of the people that you can hire. Hi, I'm late Hello. to the party, but here nonetheless. I just wanted to congratulate you all on your marketing. I mean, the penetration and the hey, ubiquity we, is everywhere. It's pretty pretty massive. Yeah, so. we've done well this city. Yeah. It, but Portland's been really kind to us. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you. 
Just a thank you, not a question. Oh man, you can come back. There we go. <laughs> Another question, Larry, and then Brian. It sounds as though there's a lot of longevity in in the uh, performance that that uh, that you've got going on. Wondering a couple of things. Wondering if there is plans for a uh, Odessio 2.0 on the on the horizon, and then also each of the ladies. What's the next great thing for your organization? Survival. <laughs> um, the producer, Norman Latterell, he's always creative. And I, I think he's got plans to do another show. I'm not sure if it's going to be uh, to do with horses. Uh, there's only so much you can do uh, without repeating yourself unless you went down the Western route or the in the olden days with knights in shining armor, you know, all of that. It's finding the, the key project to, to do something like that. I know throughout the, the world uh, and here, there's a lot of um, rodeos and stuff like that. It's just finding the right idea. And if you can find that idea, it, it's good uh, to, to, again, experiment. But I'm not sure there will be a point two. I, I think the work is done, unless it was a brand new concept. I'm always thinking of shows. You know, I, I, all, the, all the time. It's just my creative mind. Sometimes they're a bit crazy, but never mind. Sue, what's your next project? Sue? Um, well, like, do, you, do I need the microphone or? Yeah, probably so for it to be on the <laughs> film. Well, we are interested in thinking about the idea of a film festival, so that's on our screen of what we're working um, at. Um, our wall, history wall mural, there's some flyers there so you can pick that up. I think our next thing that we're trying to think about is what would be another summer event to have on the plaza that might be some combination of um, some wine and, and music. So, um, but again, we always collaborate, so we really have to find the partners to do that. But we think there really is an opportunity to do something again on the summer on the plaza. So if you have an organization that's looking at trying to figure out what might be a, a fundraiser, an event, we're there to collaborate with. In honor of Darren, it might be beer and ballet. Because uh, he brought that brought could both well of those be up. because when I say wine, it actually these days it is a combination of craft beers and wine. You don't have one without the other. They're they're now coupled together because I know that from my own family. <laughs> actually, we're having a meeting tonight of the Gresham Outdoor Public Art. And we have a list of things we have planned. Um, bike racks, for instance. Um, Carla Peluso actually adopted or took on or sponsored a bike rack. I took an old rack that we had. Actually, I asked uh, Mayor Bemis if I could take one of those racks because the bike racks they have are so boring and I wanted to make a piece of art out of it. So he said, okay. I said, just give me a chance. So I took one and that bike rack is now in front of Jazzy Bagel. Uh, Tim Fetch from Corbett created that with used all recycled reclaimed materials. So Heather Soderberg, who did the dog, actually has a bike rack in her hands and she's going to be creating um, some bike racks. That's another thing that would be very easy for someone if you wanted to purchase a bike rack. If you wanted to say, okay, Judy, I want a bike rack and we'll put your name, we'll put a plaque on it, we'll put a, uh, a nameplate on it for you, we can do that. Um, the students, and also we have another large project that may be happening um, coming in next year, uh, another bronze. Um, it's kind of something we're talking about, so I'm not going to really say what it is, but um, it, it's going to be relative to our community. And the art that we're trying to bring is kind of representational of our community, of what our community. We're a historic downtown, but we don't have a lot of historic buildings. So we're kind of creating historic looks of bikes and old fashions. I mean, my mind can go on and on about what we can do. So we have a number of projects online. Thank you. Betsy? Well, interesting that you bring up film. Um, we've been working for about a year and a half to bring uh, the Charlie Chaplin film uh, called City Lights. 
that he orchestrated himself. He wrote all the music for it as well as, as a lot of the script. It's, um, there's an organization in Paris that owns the rights to the film. And they're very, very picky about where it's released to. And it's an expensive endeavor. And then when you realize it takes 41 musicians for us, which is a smaller group, but that's still a lot of musicians, to be able to find a venue that can show a 70 millimeter film and house an audience and 41 <laughs> musicians, you start, uh, you're, you, it, it narrows it down. There's the historic Hollywood theater and um, that we are trying to work with to do that as well. But, um, and then the other thing that we're doing is trying to take breakout smaller groups, partner with another arts organization. This time it'd be Oregon Ballet Theater uh, with their um, apprentice tier of dancers to do something like Appalachian Spring that they would choreograph. And that takes, the original version is uh, 13 musicians. So it, we're looking for novel venues to hold that in instead of just a standard concert hall, maybe a, you know, a warehouse and in, uh, interesting architecture. Uh, is there any other burning question? The, I'm sure they'll stand around or stay around for a little while um, to answer any private questions that you might have. Um, with that, Brian, you want to go and say your thank yous, and then I'll go on up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How'd they do? Well, so far, so good. Okay. Well. I want to thank all of you for coming today. This has actually been very interesting for me. Um, you talked about right brain initiative. <clears throat> I'm a left brain guy, if you haven't figured that out. An engineer type. Um, so, but I do, uh, I do really appreciate uh, the arts and the performances. Uh, my daughter was in performing arts, and she was a fine artist and now a digital artist. So it's in our family. <clears throat> but um, thank you so much for coming and sharing um, this information and, and your thoughts. Um, thank you for bringing the horses <laughs> uh, and ballet and dance and all of that and coordinating that. And thank you for extending the show because you got me out of trouble with my wife. So I now have uh, time to get there and um, we'll look forward to seeing that. So with that, I'll turn thank it over. Thank you, Brian. You know, um, Darren brought horses, but there's a whole lot of horsepower on this panel. So why don't you uh, give them their due applause for the wonderful job that they've done. I want to again thank Portland General Electric and Riverview Community Bank. Didn't Larry do a good job getting the panel together today? Thank you, Larry. That was so good. Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media. Don't forget the flyers of when these are recorded are on the table as you go out. Be sure and get one of those and tell your friends to watch because there was some wonderful information provided today. The Economic Summit's coming up on September 28th. We have a national speaker coming, more to follow on that. And the upcoming topics the Gresham, uh, for this luncheon, Gresham Barlow School Bond, Measure 98, which is the career technology measure is gonna be on the forum. We'll have a candidate forum. Uh, North Clackamas has asked us to be part of their forum. That's a potential as well. Cal, Ruth Mills, the Bike Initiative Tourism. We've got a lot on our plate that's coming up. But you can't leave until you fill out the form. And you won't get out the door until you hand it to Shelley. I'm just kidding. We would appreciate knowing how you liked or disliked the forum today. Please give us your comments and we will respond. And once again, thank you, Betsy and Judy and Sue and Darren. Thank you so much for taking time with us today. And you are excused. <laughs>